Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Current Directions and Psychological Science Speaker Series presented by Pearson and APS. Our first speaker is Deborah Fish Reagan. I'm very excited to introduce her to you all. Uh, Dr. Reagan teaches psychology at Montclair State University and is an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Dr. Reagan has held several research and academic positions over the years, including a five-year appointment as an APA representative to the United Nations, where she focused on global efforts to address the psychosocial impact of HIV and AIDS. She is the author of numerous articles on HIV and AIDS, domestic violence, and healthcare disparities, and she's also the author of Health Psychology, and Interdisciplinary Approach to Health. So without further ado, uh, we'd like to move on to our first talk, where Deborah will focus on the politics of health. So I am pleased to have this opportunity to talk with you about health psychology, a rapidly growing and expanding area in the field of psychology. The title of this webinar is The Politics of Health, and it is intended to call attention to the critical influence that health policies and health systems play on individual health outcomes. Policies and systems are often designed by governing agencies or governments, hence the title, The Politics of Health. Before we get started, I'd like to give you an overview of what we're going to cover in, this, uh, in the next 30 minutes. So, we're going to first examine two examples of health policy initiatives before the 20th century to demonstrate the role of government in policies that are intended to improve or to sustain health. Next, we will look at three examples of current policies pertaining to the environment and to health systems to see how policies impact or have the potential to affect individual well-being. Third, we will identify two models that attempt to explain health outcomes as an interaction of individual behavior, environment, and health systems and policies. And finally, we will define or redefine the important determinants of health as indicated in the two models and by history. So let's begin with an example of health policy demonstrated through archaeological evidence and corresponding records. The archaeological discovery shown in this slide dates back to about 2000 BCE or BC and reveals a private home in a village built by the Harappian civilization located in a region then known as the Indus Valley region, an area near not modern day Pakistan. This particular discovery is in the Mohenjo Daro section of the valley and reveals a well planned city, including a leverage drainage systems in both public and private dwellings. And the excavated area in the slide shows the bath area in a private dwelling. The opening in the wall that you see is the drainage system for that residence that allows wastewater to leave the house and to drain into a sewage, common sewage system for the village. The archaeological archaeologists in this region when they were excavating also discovered large water reservoirs to provide clean drinking water for the inhabitants. And furthermore, they learned that the Harappian civilization enacted very strict municipal regulations on cleanliness, including regulations governing sewage and waste removal. The municipal regulations on cleanliness, the elaborate drainage system and water reservoirs show that this civilization placed great importance on access to clean water and tra treatment of wastewater. And all of this was introduced and maintained by municipal governments. So we fast forward now to the 19th century, and here we see another example of the interaction of policy and health shown through the work of Sir Edwin Chadwick in the mid-1800s. Chadwick was an English journalist and social reformer who studied the relationship between the unsanitary living and working conditions and health in London, England, and in near, nearby rural areas. More specifically, he focused on the living and working conditions of the poor and of the working poor in an effort to try to improve their health outcomes. His work was central then and also now because his findings led to the adoption of the Public Health Act and the Nuisance Removal and Disease Prevention Act of 1848 in the United Kingdom. And those acts sought to address the illnesses, uh, Ill illnesses of the residents by improving their environmental condition, uh, and particularly among the poor, and addressing their economic issues as well. 
His findings that are summarized in the next slide are rather important, so I wanted to take a few minutes to go over them. He actually produced a three-volume work called The Survey into the Sanitary Conditions of the Laboring Classes in Great Britain. And in this work, uh, which was rather extensive. He examined the impact of the environment and socioeconomic class on health using mortality rates as a measure of health. The findings may seem a bit unremarkable to us now, but at the time they were stark. Remember, this was the 1840s, and his was one of only a very few systematic studies to examine the effects of the environment and of class on health. Overall, his results showed that the higher one's socioeconomic class, the longer was one's life expectancy. Specifically, the gentry, what we would call the aristocrats and the professionals, lived on average two times longer than people in the wage or working class. And those in the lifespan of those that were in the trained or skilled um, socioeconomic class uh, or shop owners was really more comparable to that of people living who were in the working class. When you look at the infant death rates, you see that they show a similar story as well. Infants born into the working class families were 2.5 times more likely to die in infancy than were those born to the gentry or to professional families. Furthermore, Chadwick's results really showed that there was a relationship between the filth, as he called it, in one living environment, including the contaminants in the air and in the water and soil, that all and that all of those contributed to the spread of disease, especially in crowded urban areas. Another small jump will, jump will take us into the 20th and the 21st century, where we see evidence of national, and by here I mean U.S., um, policy and global efforts to address the role of the environment and of health systems on the well-being of individuals and communities. All of this, again, is done through health policies. We also see the evidence of policies aimed at controlling the admission of contaminants and reversing, to the extent possible, the impact of past practices. So for example, if we look at a current example of global health policy, we can take the Kyoto Protocol. This uh, is a binding agreement among 37 countries which are currently um, signed and on board to reduce the greenhouse emissions that are believed to cause increased warming of the Earth's surface. The protocol is evidence of um, a global effort to embrace the belief that the actions of the industry or industries in any one country can affect the health and well-being of residents in another. The domestic examples of health policy in the U.S. are seen by the U.S. Clean Air and Clean Water Act. These acts regulate the type and the quantity and frequency of pollutants that can be released into the air and the water. Now, undoubtedly, all of these regulations protect the environment, but they also ensure clean air and water for human consumption. In addition to these policies, there are also policies that are intended to correct past actions, as in the case of Superfund sites and, in other cases, the results of some natural disasters. We'll take Superfund sites first. These Superfund sites are basically hazardous waste sites. They're, that means that they are land, they are water that's been contaminated by toxic chemicals that are dangerous to human health and to the environment, and they are areas that have been identified by the federal government for cleanup. Research about the interaction of these areas, the Superfund sites, and the health of uh, inhabitants of communities nearby have shown that these sites are clearly linked to health problems for people living in or near them. These problems include lung and breast cancer, leukemia, skin rashes, as well as respiratory diseases. And then there's Hurricane Katrina. Now, a lot has been said about the numerous problems and the costly errors in preparation for and in response to this Category 5 hurricane that devastated parts of New Orleans and of the Gulf, Gulf Coast region of Mississippi. But there are two things that this storm and its aftermath showed about health systems and infrastructure that they're uh, pointing out, I think, at this point. First, it's important to remember that there was an infrastructure in New Orleans and the surrounding area that protected the water supply and that handled sewage and wastewater uh, disposal. This system failed given the intensity of the storm. But it is the existence of such, such systems that's often taken for granted until such a disaster. And that is true in the United States and in other developed countries. But there are other regions in the world where similar water and waste systems uh, are not available, they are missing, and those residents regularly face challenges to their health due to the environmental contaminants, even in calm weather. 
A second thing that this system reminds us, that, that the storm reminds us about, is that um, there was a backup, there were backup systems available. Now those two were fraught with problems. They weren't delivered as effectively or as timely as we would have hoped. But when they were able to be um, initiated and, and fully utilized, they did help to minimize the enormous toll in terms of illness and disease and death that could have occurred had those systems not been available. For sure, the end result of the Hurricane Katrina was that it was a deadly and costly hurricane in the United States. Some records have it as the third deadliest um, hurricane in the U.S. It numbered about 1,800 deaths. But some of the other health disasters that were expected did not materialize at the rate that one would have expected given the scale and the destruction brought on by the storm. For example, there were reported 140 cases of diarrhea, 289 cases of infectious diseases, and no reported cases of cholera. And this last board is important because whenever there is an impediment or a danger to one's water supply, cholera is the first and likely disease that is, will come about as a result of those interruptions in those systems. Hurricane Katrina Superfund sites could be considered extreme examples of the impact of environment on health. So now let us consider a more common occurrence, such as the impact of secondhand smoke on health. Just to review, most of you know for sure that cigarette smoke is hazardous to one's health, and the statistics clearly show a causal link between smoking and cancer. For example, as you can see in the slide, Smoking is linked to 90% of lung cancer deaths and another 75% of deaths from oral or pharyngeal cancer. And while studies show that 85 to 90% of persons with lung cancer were in fact smokers, there do remain about 10 to 15% of people who contracted lung cancer who were non-smokers. That was that they were exposed to secondhand smoke. No doubt some of those 10 to 15% comprised the 3,000 persons who were identified in a 2006 Harvard Medical School study who were non-smokers but who contracted lung cancer from secondhand smoke. Now it's important to remember right now that cigarettes are a legal substance. They're deadly, but they are legal. And here is where health policy comes in. Policies that ban smoking in specific venues were enacted in part to protect the health and well-being of the non-smoker to limit their exposure to the carcinogens in cigarette smoke and to minimize the health consequences of such contaminants to the non-smoker. So that currently we have at least 33 states which limit a non-smoker's exposure to secondhand smoke by prohibiting smoking in bars, restaurants, movie theaters, workplace environments, and other sites. There are also federal bans prohibiting smoking on public forms of transportation, including airplanes, buses, and trains, and other federal buildings. And so the question would be now at this point, given these policies, have the policies helped to improve the outcome of non-smokers who would have been exposed to these contaminants? And it seems that the initial findings from research that, uh, adjust, that looks at this question say yes. Studies conducted in the UK and the US um, on the, looking at the health changes for bartenders showed that there are significantly lower rates of wheezing, coughing, and incidences of inflammation of the lungs than previously reported among that group. So now let's take another look at the impact of this time healthcare systems on individual well-being. And I think this is a timely issue given the current and ongoing discussions in the US Congress regarding healthcare reform. Again, research aids us in examining this issue. In an international study comparing two populations, one in the UK and the other in the US, uh, looking specifically at the prevalence of selected chronic health conditions, including heart disease and diabetes, we find some very useful data and some helpful information that explains the impact of healthcare systems on individuals. This carefully designed study by Banks and colleagues, which is summarized in this slide, uh, is a good place to start. Banks and his colleagues limited uh, the study to one ethnic group, specifically Caucasians, to minify, minimize confounding variables on the health outcomes, such as socioeconomic class, that have been shown to be um, uh, to, to shown to influence health status. And in addition, Banks and colleagues carefully matched both samples in the United Kingdom and the United States to control for the effects of age, gender, and education on health. With those careful controls, those, the authors found a significant difference in the reported rates of hypertension, heart disease, heart attack, stroke, 
and other chronic conditions between the two samples. The rates of the conditions were considerably higher in the U.S. sample when compared to the U.K. sample. And this was true in spite of the fact that the U.K. sample reported higher rates of smoking and drinking than the U.S. sample, the very behaviors that we know contribute to many of the forms of heart disease examined in the study. So what's the explanation? How come there's a difference? The authors suggest several reasons. First, they acknowledge the likely role of diet, which over time can lead to such chronic conditions. But they concluded that the single best explanation for the difference in the health outcomes of the two populations is access to long-term and preventive care. Specifically, the access that the UK sample has through the, the England system of universal health care. They suggest that unimpeded access to care, that is, access that's not dependent on one's ability to pay or one's access to affordable health insurance plans through the workplace, seems to be a factor. The second factor, focus on preventive care, is a hallmark of many universal or single-player plans, and that, too, seems to be uh, to the benefit of the population in the UK, that is, minimizing the likelihood of these chronic illnesses. And finally, and this is big, the researchers proposed that the working class and lower income study participants in the UK sample were found to have better health outcomes than the US study participants who were among the upper middle and wealthy classes in the United States. This is a finding that appears to challenge Chadwick's earlier studying showing that socioeconomic class does indeed affect health outcomes. But what Banks and his colleagues seem to suggest is that socioeconomic class need not be a determinant of health outcomes if, and this is kind of a big if, if people face no barriers to ongoing medical care over time as part of a long-term system of care. One last example of barriers to care and its impact on an individual's health can be seen in a population of young adults in the United States. And let's see if we can get this slide to move. There we are. Um, the researchers uniformly agree that young adults are the least likely age group to be insured. As the Commonwealth Foundation study reports, almost half, about 46% of persons 24 to 29 years of age, age surveyed for this study are uninsured. The reasons that this they cite for the lack of insurance is primarily cost. Two-thirds list cost is a barrier to obtaining health insurance. And others cite the inability to access care, that is, it's too expensive through the workplace or it's not offered. Finally, another group su suggests that they are healthy and therefore they don't need care. There are fallacies in all of those arguments. Young adults may in fact be healthy at any given time, but they do have the highest incidences of emergency medical care than all other age groups. And what we know about medical care cost is that the cost of care increases greatly when using emergency services rather than using services as part of a long-term ongoing uh, management of care, a management of health care. The cost also increased dramatically when one delays obtaining care in a timely manner for the illness, something that again, according to the Commonwealth study, is a common occurrence for young adults in the 21 to 29 age group. So time to recap. We took a leap through history. Uh, up to now, and we see that both pre and post uh, 20th century through artifacts and records and research, we see that there's a relationship between physical environment and health. We clearly see from past records and evidence uh, and current studies that environment is seen as a critical determinant of health, and we also see that there's a clear contribution to health policy and health sy systems that affect an individual's health status. So. What does that tell us about the factors that shape and influence our health? We can look at two models particularly, specifically that look at both environment and systems as major factors. One is the environmental model, which examines the individual's behaviors and systems in the larger context of the environment to explain an individual's overall health status. And it contends that individual states of health will be determined in part by their adaptability to the environment. The environmental model is definitely an interesting theory, but it's one that has proven very difficult for researchers to test. And so therefore, what becomes a little bit more compelling to current researchers uh, who are looking for a more expansive model is the socio-ecological model. It, too, is a model that includes environment and policy as major factors, but has the added advantage of being, uh, being testable. So Let's look at this model for, brief, for a brief few minutes. It includes um, all the elements, physical environment, health systems, and health policy that we've been talking about in this webinar. 
uh, as part of uh, as three of five essential determinants. In total, the model, as you see on your screen, begins with the individual. It's at the center. Uh, and includes as the individual uh, both the biological makeup that the person brings to the table as well as their behavior, their lifestyles, things that they choose to do that contribute to their health outcome. It includes social environment on the right side, which means uh, here a person's family and cultural practices, traditions, peer influences, and the influences that those people and organizations hold over the health behaviors of the individual. It includes physical environment on the left. We've already discussed at great length physical environment, so I think that part is clear. It includes health systems on the bottom, which, as banks and others have indicated, explains the effects of limited or no access to health service on health status. And finally, at the top, it includes health policy, decisions made by governments or governing agencies that impact the individual. And these include treatment of water, land, soil, other living working conditions, and yes, even the type of health care systems that might be available, such as the discussions that are happening currently in the U.S. Congress. So what does this mean going forward? Where does this leave us? I contend that history and current studies show that there is a need for renewed focus on the role of the environment, on health systems, and health policy on individual outcomes. We also need to examine the benefits of a system of care that emphasizes preventive health services over a long term as opposed to intermittent services to address a specific problem when it occurs. That is not the best way to treat and to maintain long-term health status. And finally, we need to consider all of this uh, in the current, in sight of the current health, health policy discussions that are aimed at repairing the U.S. health system. As we know that the health policies and the type of health policies um, over the last 4,000 4, years have had an impact on the health and well-being of communities, the health policies that we decide now will have a similar effect. Thank you very much. Well, let's switch gears to our master teacher Q&A. And just to give a little introduction, Nancy Simpson is our master teacher for health psychology. And she's been teaching at Trident Technical College in Charleston, South Carolina for 22 years, both in traditional and online formats. So she's got lots of experience. And so now what we're going to do is just take your questions related to how we can bring this really interesting new science into the classroom. So instructors, if you have questions, we'd love to hear from you. And I know we have a lot of students on the line. So students, if you have questions, if you have comments or suggestions, we love to hear those as well. So we have some questions that were sent in ahead of time. Um, but also, if you have questions now that you'd like to ask, you can do so using the question box chat. Okay, so um, I'll get started with our first question. So Nancy, um, we have a question here that asks from an instructor, and it is, are there any particular class exercises or formative assessments that might be helpful to convey the topic of health psychology to students? Sure. I think um, uh, applying uh, research is, uh, is the most fascinating thing you can do in class. And there's so many uh, different, oh, mini class exercises you could do, um, pretty much on any topic. Um, many folks are aware of, uh, well, formally they're called formative assessments, um, quickie things to make sure that, that the students are understanding and applying the knowledge. Uh, th things such as, uh, I think most people have heard of the one minute essay, where you can actually um, do a question specific to health psychology, specific to the politics of health, and to make sure students are really getting it, um, have them uh, write to that topic just for 30 to 60 seconds. Um, feedback is important, so it's a give and take of you know, what the students can come with and to you and what you can give back to them. Uh, there's many other formative assessments. Um, index cards, summary questions, uh, uh, little mini games. There's the, the classic pair and share techniques. You know, and any of the, the uh, communicative strategies where you can get your students thinking and thinking on a critical level is, uh, can be really very, very helpful. Great, thanks. 
Um, and so we have time for a couple more questions. So here's another one from an instructor who teaches intro psych. And the question is, um, I don't cover health psychology in my intro psych course. However, I do want my students to be aware of it as an area of research. What suggestions do you have? Ah, the good old introductory psychology class. So we, you know, we cover so many topics that seem separate and distinct in, in general psychology or introduction to psychology. And, and I think the key is to make health psychology or any topic um, linked together. Um, linkages are important. So certainly health psychology topics can fit with um, the stress topics in general psychology. Um, in introductory psychology, uh, the learning chapter, um, abnormal chapter. Uh, it's important to sort of, as you go, um, pull in the current research and make sure it gets linked to the classic um, historical topics of, that we cover in intro psychology. Great, thanks. Um, and then let's switch gears uh, to a student who's actually interested in exploring more about this topic kind of outside of class in the real world. So as a student, how can I learn more about this topic outside of class is the question. Ah, the real world applications, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it, it, too bad we don't have um, two-way audio and visual here because I could look into students' eyes and say, well, what, what do you think? How, how would you... How would you um, start researching this? How would you tackle this? And if I put my student hat on, um, nowadays I would uh, go to the web first, of course. You know, and what can you do beyond Google and Wikipedia and the, the basic things? That's certainly one way to start. Um, probably a real good resource, best resource we have, resource, excuse me, we have in psychology is, is the APA, the American Psychological Association. So um, again, online, um, look at the APA, the American Psychological Association, and get to their journals. Um, in health psychology specifically, there's the Journal of Health Psychology. There's also ancillary journals like um, the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology, and there's many, many other related journals that are available for students, for everybody actually, um, a lot of times with fully online text available free and online. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, one is asking for just one specific fun teaching exercise. If you were to pick one thing um, on this topic, what would you suggest? One fun thing. Fun. Mm. <laughs> fun. Um, well, for me, fun is... Gosh, there's fun. There's there's you know playful games within class, but there's also um, fun of how to think more in depth. So the trick is to combine a playful thing in class with actually getting the material more in depth. And I'm I'm thinking um, to relate this to current events. Certainly the um, the politics of health and uh, our current events really applies to our current political situation. And whatever background and uh, you're from, we, we certainly have huge health care issues in this country. So you could bring um, those issues in a, um, a kind of a pro and con format um, where students would, uh, you know, very briefly within class time, get the, uh, the topic, um, do, you know, 30 minutes of, uh, of background, and, and present a uh, kind of a, a pro and con um, on, the, on the topic of, of health care, for example, and, and, and funding health care, and, you know, make it specific to our current political situation, and make students pick a side. Even if they don't believe in that side, the fun part comes in conveying a side and then having a, you know, a mini debate within class. I'm not sure. Does that sound fun? <laughs> not fun to me. <laughs> and I think you kind of um, touched on this 
but this is relating, this question is really more to class assignments. So the question is, without taking up too much time in the classroom, how can I bring in current issues in the news, such as healthcare, in a way that is meaningful to my students? Yeah, and I think as a, as a, uh, you know, as instructors, we, we often wrestle with, um, you know, what can we do to present to our students? What, you know, we're, we're doing the work and the research and so on. In this case, I'm thinking of current events that students do. So you put the burden on the students to um, actually do some, um, do some investigation, do some work. Um, you can take, um, for example, five minutes before each class period and, and have it um, current event time um, where students who have uh, are, you know, gone out and done a little bit of looking and a little bit of research and then they come in and, and present applicable things at the beginning of class, the first five minutes of class, but make it current, make it topical, and make it applicable. Great. And I love, we have one comment here from Cheryl Hartman, uh, one of our inspector attendees, and I love it. <laughs> Our suggestion is to make the activity so powerful that the students then want to teach this to their parents and peers and significant others. Um, so I love that. Um, I should also like more tips here. I think you've provided a bunch. Any last words of wisdom on that subject to how we can help to inspire our students to go out and kind of spread the word to their parents and peers and everyone they meet about what they've learned about health psychology? Wow. <laughs> That's daunting. It, it sounds, you know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, powerful, fabulous stuff is, is, is great and fabulous, but that's a daunting task to be able to do that every single class period and every single time. Sometimes the, the, the little things that we don't think students are responding to are, are the real wow and aha moments that they, they pass on. And a lot of times that has to do with um, either something that touch them, touches them personally or something that's um, humorous. Uh, so if you can do humor well, that is often conveyed and passed on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nancy and Deborah. Um, we are at the end of our first session, believe it or not. So I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, if you plan to attend our second session, I hope you will join us. We resume at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and our next session is focused on social psychology and language.